Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this evening, which promises to be a really interesting one. First of all, tonight, I would like to ask the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong to say a few words. Thank you, Terry. Um, I'm a medical doctor, so being in a hospital, I always feel extremely relaxed. But being in a court, I always feel extremely tense. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to just say a few words of welcome. Um, as as uh, Terry and, and uh, Professor Spencer know, I can't stay for the lecture, and I'd like to because it's a very interesting topic. But I did want to just really add a few words of welcome to all of you, particularly to the visitors from the University of Cambridge, to Professor Spencer and uh, uh, colleagues who've, uh, who've travelled with him. Uh, despite the best efforts of the typhoon to upset the planning of today, we've managed to salvage a signing ceremony just now and the lecture's carrying on as scheduled. So I'm very pleased that the weather hasn't got in the way. Um, many of you will know that I'm an alumnus of the University of Cambridge myself and I'm very pleased that the University of Cambridge is demonstrating its commitment to this partnership. Um, it's starting in the Faculty of Law. I hope it will extend to other parts of the university. For this particular venture, the Joint Centre of Medical ethics and law and this indeed this lecture we have to thank the wing foundation and the hatton trust represented here respectively by anthony ing and ron zimmern uh, for their support and uh, also colleagues in uh, the university of cambridge and indeed here at the university of hong kong for making this happen it's a very significant partnership i hope this is the beginning of a very fruitful link between the two universities and a topic which I think is of great interest both in terms, not, not just to the Vice Chancellor, but also to the public, to the students and staff of both universities. So the topics that you're going to hear discussed, I think will be uh, important, socially important as well as academically and educationally important. I'm looking forward to uh, watching the web stream, even though I can't stay for the live performance. Um, so welcome to you all. Um, thank you to the benefactors for promoting this link and thank you to the Faculty of Law here and the Faculty of Law in Cambridge for contributing to what I hope will be a long and very happy partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Tonight's Wing Hatton Lecture is jointly organised by the University of Cambridge, the <coughs> University of Hong Kong this, and the Centre for Medical Ethics and Law of uh, this university. It may be appropriate for me um, at this point to give a short introduction to the Centre for Medical Ethics and Law. The Centre for Medical Ethics and Law was established in 2012. It is a true pioneer in this field as it is the first centre of its kind in Hong Kong. The centre is a truly interdisciplinary centre as, as it is established as an equal partnership and joint venture between the Faculty of Law and the Li Ka Ching Faculty of Medicine of this, universe, of this university. So this interdisciplinary structure backed by the uh, combined professional and, and academic resources of the two faculties gives us the authority and confidence to fulfill our mission of providing leadership for Hong Kong in our chosen arena of medical ethics and law. Professor John Spencer was a professor in the Cambridge University Law Faculty from 1995 to 2013. On retirement, he became Professor Emeritus. He's an honorary Queen's Consul. He's a life fellow at Selden College, Cambridge. And from the 1st of October, he will also become a fellow of Mary Edwards College, of which um, I'm not sure if Dame Barbara is here, um, <clears throat> of which uh, Dame Barber is president of the college. In this academic year, Professor John Spencer became one of Cambridge's uh, team of deputy vice chancellors. His range of interests include criminal law and the law of torts, and through these, medical law. In the context of the recent benefaction of the Wing Foundation and the Hatton Trust to the Cambridge Law Faculty, Professor Spencer will be uh, the Hatton Wing Medical Law, Ethics and Policy Program Distinguished Advisor and also Chair of the Faculty's Medical Law, Ethics and Policy Committee. He takes as his team, theme tonight a very topical and I think a very urgent inquiry 
He asks if it is possible to incur civil or criminal liability for the transmission of illnesses from one person to another. As a matter of principle, should it be possible? The immediate relevance of his team tonight will not be lost in society's grappling with the realities of the HIV, AIDS, SARS, MERS, and now the Ebola epidemics. At the end of Professor Spencer's lecture, I will be inviting questions from the audience. Um, in the interest of uh, allowing maximum participation and accommodating the many of us who have other pressing appointments tonight to go on to, please keep your questions short and to the point. I will also ask you um, to limit your questions to a single point or, or issue or a single comment. May I now invite Professor John Spencer to deliver the Wing Hatton Lecture 2014. Professor Spencer. I'd like to start by endorsing what the director, uh, Jerry Khan, has just said about the center in Hong Kong University and just mentioned that there is, as part of the cooperation plan between the two universities, to be, in future, a parallel centre in the law faculty at the University of Cambridge. And we hope that between them, these centres will help to explore new frontiers in medical law and medical ethics. The old frontiers of medical law and medical ethics might be described as doctors in trouble. Criminal liability of doctors, which means life and death decisions made by doctors with an eye to the criminal courts afterwards. Civil liability of doctors, liability for professional negligence, liability for breach of confidentiality and maybe as an add-on extra professional discipline of doctors for misbehaving and not following the ethics of their profession um, as they're supposed to do. And then bit by bit, certain other things added on like resource allocation and so on. And when preparing to give this lecture, I read the wide ranging lecture that Dr. Ron Zimmern gave last year to celebrate the uh, creation of the Hong Kong Center in which he pointed out that the future of medical law is potentially many broader things as well. Public health genomics, health and information, that's to say um, information about the health of individuals and who can access it and how people who think they're ill can access information about how they could possibly be treated. And the ethics of state interference in health generally. And we hope that the centers in the future will explore these matters as well as, and in parallel with the more traditional frontiers, namely doctors in trouble. I got into medical law because I knew about the doctors in trouble business, both criminal liability and civil liability. And my talk is going to be traditional in as much as it's going to be about people in trouble, but it's not doctors in trouble, it's patients in trouble. It's about criminal liability for the transmission of disease in general and with particular reference to sexually transmissible diseases and with sexually transmissible diseases HIV but not exclusively because it will mention other ones as well and this has been a topic of discussion among thoughtful lawyers for many many years the first one that I know in the common law tradition to have looked into it is Sir Matthew Hale, judge from the 17th century, the most thoughtful and reflective of lawyers, who wrote a book when he was in his 60s called The History of the Pleas of the Crown. A wonderful book, 
which for some reason wasn't published until the middle of the 18th century. There's the title page, so you can see I didn't make it up, and it really does exist. <laughs> and you'll see that he actually discussed this particular issue under the rather gloomy title Moriendi Mille Figurae, which I think means many faces of dying. And in particular, he's discussing there whether it might be a felony, meaning murder or manslaughter, to communicate your serious infectious disease, your plague, to other people. And he thought it rather shouldn't be for the three reasons which you see is there, which, though expressed in ancient language, have some reflection in modern thought today because it is hard to discern whether the infection arise from the party or from the contagion of the air. It is God's arrow, illness as God's arrow. Secondly, nature prompts every man in what condition soever to preserve himself, which cannot be well without mutual conversation. Perhaps transmitting disease is a bit different. People need to live, see other people to live. They need to seek treatment Perhaps that should condition whether people should be criminally liable, and in particular for murder or manslaughter, when they give their diseases to others. And thirdly, contagious diseases as plague, pestilential fevers, smallpox, and etc., are common among mankind by the visitation of God, and the extension of capital punishments in cases of this nature would multiply severe punishments too far and give too great latitude and loose to severe punishment. And it would all be too tough and too burdensome on the sick. So note, he was talking about whether you might be guilty of murder or manslaughter. He wasn't talking, he wasn't saying whether it should be criminal any involve any criminal liability at all. He does seem to suggest at the end of the big paragraph at the top, it might be a misdemeanor, so not a felony. Let's now jump forward about 200 years from when Hale wrote, and a bit less than that from when his book was published, to the statute of provision around which the development of the law has grown in the last 10 or 15 years in the United Kingdom, or in England and Wales, and I think in Hong Kong too. The offences against the Person Act 1861 a rather ragbag piece of legislation which includes section 20 in the English statute, whosoever shall unlawfully and maliciously wound or inflict grievous bodily harm upon any, any person, either with or without any weapon or instrument, shall be guilty of an offence and being convicted thereof shall be liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years. And I believe I'm right in saying that here the law in Hong Kong is the same because you have the offences against the person ordered in Hong Kong and our section 20 is your section 19, which says just the same, except for a bit kinder and the maximum penalty is fixed at three years instead. And for those of you who are not criminal lawyers and not familiar with all this already, let me give you a very brief lesson about the meaning of the terms in section 20 or section 19, depending where we are. Unlawfully and maliciously wounds or inflicts any grievous bodily harm. Inflicts means causes. It's causing in an unpleasant way. And that is the sense in which the courts interpret nowadays inflicts in the context that criminal event. Maliciously is interpreted to mean intentionally or recklessly, and recklessly means with advertent negligence. That's to say, behaving unreasonably in the light of a risk of which you are yourself aware. Being aware of a risk and running the risk when a reasonable person in your position wouldn't. Both subjective, are you aware of the risk, and objective, is it unreasonable for somebody who is aware of that risk to run it? 
you would think on the face of it that that offence would in principle cover the reckless transmission of diseases to others. But back in the, 18th, in the 19th century, in 1888, in the case of Clarence, the English courts decided that it didn't. Mr. Clarence had infected his wife with gonorrhea in the usual sort of way through sexual intercourse, and he was prosecuted for Section 20, among other things. And it was decided on appeal that what he'd done did not constitute a breach of the section. First of all, they said infecting requires an assault, some hostile physical act, which is absent in the case of sexual intercourse. And secondly, they said she consented. That seems a bit odd. She consented to sex, but she didn't consent to catch a disease. Um, you can consent, if you put arsenic in my tea, I consent to drink the tea, but I don't consent to drink the arsenic, do I? But nevertheless, they said if she consented to sex, she consented to all the diseases she might get when she caught it. And that was the law for many years, and the case was usually said to be unsound in terms of legal reasoning, but possibly justifiable for practical reasons. And Professor Blanchard Williams, in the second edition of his textbook, put the classic lawyer's reaction to the case, as it then was, um, when he said, um, it doesn't seem to make sense in terms of legal principle. And they gave a perverted interpretation to the phrase inflicts, and so on. But then, final paragraph, the last four lines of the PowerPoint slide, um, it was unfortunate but maybe there were practical reasons. You know, a recognized policy against prosecuting for infectious disease and because it might inhibit people in seeking, um, in seeking treatment and so on. So maybe there were reasons for it, but as a matter of legal principle, it didn't seem to make much sense. In 1993, the Law Commission produced one of its many ignored papers on reforming the criminal law and they brought the Offences Against the Person Act is a mess, which it is, and they proposed replacing it with something better and clearer, and in the course of it, they said they thought it was anomalous that under the existing law, you couldn't be prosecuted for a criminal offence when you recklessly transmitted a disease. The so Home Office, um, a few years later, produced a beneficial response to the Law Commission report, and they said they thought it was right they said they thought the criminal liability for transmitting infectious diseases should be limited to the case where you do it on purpose, where you deliberately infect somebody with the aim of causing them some harm, and that it shouldn't cover the situation where you infect them recklessly, simply by knowingly exposing them to the risk, though you don't actually want it to happen. And that was what they actually said. The government... Labour government at the time, Tony Blair's government, is particularly concerned that the law should not seem to discriminate against those who are HIV positive, have AIDS or viral hepatitis, or who carry any kind of disease, nor do we want to discourage people coming forward for diagnostic tests because of an unfounded fear of prosecution. And there things stood until the judges made a change of direction in a trilogy of cases in which they overruled Clarence. They said that Section 20 of the Offences Against the Person Act could indeed apply if somebody recklessly infects another person and even with um, a sexually transmitted disease transmitted in consensual sexual intercourse. Um, Dika and Konzani were both cases of HIV infection and the most recent one, Golding, decided earlier this year, was a case of genital herpes, which was transmitted to an unknowing sexual partner by a man who knew that he'd been suffering from it and therefore was aware of a risk of passing it on. Um, there is from the BBC News Channel about the Dika case when he was first prosecuted. And he appealed, 
to the Court of Appeal, and there was agitation by people who thought it was most unfair, who caused there to be a public meeting in London to talk about it. They said serious questions about law, health, race, and sexuality are being ignored or overlooked, and they circulated, they thought, possibly sympathetic academics to go and start lobbying people to make sure the Court of Appeal overturned the conviction. And I'm afraid they sent it to the wrong person when they sent it to me, because I thought that the conviction was entirely right. And instead of joining a clamor for the conviction to be reversed, I joined a clamor for the conviction to be affirmed. And I wrote an article saying I thought that Clarence was wrongly decided and ought to be overruled. And then, in due course, the Court of Appeal, citing my article, said Clarence was wrong and should be overruled. And they affirmed that they, they actually quashed Deeker's conviction because of a misdirection by the trial judge who had said that um, it was irrelevant whether the woman consented, but uh, they sent it back for a retrial on the basis that he could be convicted if she hadn't consented, if she'd not known, actually, if the two women in the case had not been aware that the man they were having a sexual relationship with, with unprotected sexual intercourse, was HIV positive. And he, at his retrial, he said they knew, and they said they didn't know, and he was convicted second time round, and he got four and a half years imprisonment. Um, the next case, Mr. Konzani got some pretty hostile press coverage initially, as you see there. That's from The Guardian, which is our most staid and liberal and sensitive serious newspaper. Mr. Konzani had managed to infect three people with HIV, the first being a girl of 15 whose first sexual relationship was with him and who was a virgin prior to having sex with Konzani. It was her and there were two others. His defense was, well, if they didn't know I was HIV positive, I thought they did know. That's what he said through his lawyer. But he didn't say that in evidence at the trial. He didn't give evidence in his defense at trial. And he was convicted. And he appealed. And the Court of Appeal upheld his conviction. The Court of Appeal here said, a defendant who runs this line of defense, well, who claims that he thought the other person consented, is entitled to an acquittal if the jury think that his defense might be true, because for the purpose of general defenses, as the lawyers among you will know, you are usually judged on the facts as you believe them to be. However, they said a defendant who runs this line of defense bears an evidential burden. He must go into the witness box and give evidence that that's what he thought, and he can't expect to be acquitted if he doesn't give evidence to say that that's what he thought the position was. So they affirmed his conviction, and they also affirmed the 10-year sentence that he'd had with cumulative sentences for um, grievous, maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm by giving HIV virus to three women. Um, so he lost his appeal. And there was a fuss, and his cause was taken up by... Matthew Weird, my academic colleague Matthew Weird, who has campaigned with enthusiasm to try to get the law changed back again to ensure that those who recklessly infect other people, in particular with HIV, should not be possible, should not be capable of being prosecuted. He wrote a book called Intimacy and Responsibility. The rather strange picture on the front, which you may not decipher, is actually of somebody sticking their tongue into somebody else's mouth. It's not quite the picture that I would have chosen to put on the front of a book, <laughs> which I was trying to get respectable and staid opinion on my side. But uh, Matthew Weert is a man of great energy. I admire his passion, and I admire his sincerity, and I admire his ability to remain on polite terms with people like myself with whom he d disagrees. 
but I completely disagree with him. Um, and he didn't have much traction with his argument in getting anybody to actually do anything about changing the law back again. And then most recently we had the, the um, Golding case. Mr. Golding, as I mentioned, was prosecuted for infecting his sexual partner with genital herpes. And his line of defense was, it isn't bad enough, I mean, to be grievous bodily harm, among other things. But the Court of Appeal decided it was within the uh, scope of decision making by the jury to decide that genital herpes is grievous bodily harm. And they affirmed his conviction, though they reduced his sentence in fact, they reduced his sentence to only a few weeks imprisonment, mainly because it had taken so long for the case to work through the courts while he'd had all of this uh, on his head. And there was controversy about this as well. The Herpes Viruses Association put out an immediate press release that said that we're appalled at the court's failure to overturn the guilty verdict. Herpes virus transmission should not be in the legal arena at all. And of course, it all got taken up in the newspapers and in the comment sections in the newspapers like the Daily Mail, which are full of all sorts of extraordinary things that people write in and say. <laughs> the Herpes Association basic line was, herpes isn't that bad. How can anybody say herpes is grievous bodily harm? Yes, well, I rather agree with those of you who laugh, I have to say. and. Um, one of the saner online comments I saw was from a professional woman who evidently likes reading the Daily Mail despite being a professional person. <laughs> and that's what she, she says, rubbish. If you knowingly infect someone, it's a completely different thing. He didn't have to have sex with her knowing he'd infect her. It's an infection that can't be cured. It's with you forever. And there things stand at the moment. Um, the offence is used occasionally to prosecute people who recklessly transmit STDs in England, and it so could be in Hong Kong. I don't know whether in Hong Kong it has been, but because your law on this is basically the same as ours, it certainly could be. So that's where we now are. What should the legal position be in respect of this? It seems to me there are three possibilities. Possibility number one, you could go further than English law's done and specifically criminalize STD transmission or HIV transmission or reckless disease transmission in any sort of way. Or thirdly, you could, how I've put it there, treat normally prosecute if the general law of offences against the person applies, but not otherwise. Or you could do what my colleague um, Matthew Witt says you should do and specifically decriminalize it, except when it's done with intention to cause harm. And I think, logically, the way to develop this talk is to take the third possibility first and to analyze the arguments in favor of not having criminal liability for the reckless transmission of infectious diseases. A long list have been put forward over the years. In the course of this lecture, I'll have to deal with them all pretty summarily. There's more to be said about some of them, and I must excuse myself against those who have written at length developing some of these points, because I won't have time to deal with them the great length. Keep the criminal law out of the bedroom. That was one of the arguments that was used in the 19th century by the judges in the Clarence case. Mr. Justice Will said, a wide door will be open to inquiries not of wholesome kind. Ugh. <laughs> judges, the courts are clean. Ugh, sex bedrooms, we can't come near it in which the difficulties of arriving at truth are often enormous and in which the danger of going wrong is as great as it is by people in general uh, inadequately appreciated. Ugh, we, we don't want to get into this. Very old-fashioned, I think. And all of a part with 
the way the law used to look at the relationship between husband and wife. If you go back to the 18th century, it was actually thought lawful, or 17th century, for a husband to administer reasonable chastisement to his wife. He could beat her as long as it wasn't too fiercely and too long. And then years after the law changed, it was stood in practice, tolerated that men could beat their wives. Oh, it's just the domestic, so we don't want to get involved in that. Oh, no, I know you've been hearing him be beat his wife up, but um, no, we're, we're the police, we don't get involved in that. And, you know, incest never happens, or if it does, it's best not prosecuted, that sort of thing. Very out-of-date views, and I think we can discount that one. He does perhaps come something nearer as what we'd regard as a sensible point when he said these di cases raise difficulties of proof. It's one person's word against another. But so throughout the law of sexual offences, at any rate, the less serious ones, it's likely to be one person's word against another, and you can't not prosecute for criminal offences simply because of that. It's unfair to discriminate against the sick, it said, that was one of the things the Home Office said when they didn't want the law to be changed by statute and they sought to affirm the Clarence decision. I think that's a very muddled argument myself. Yes, it discriminates against the sick to the extent that it's only the sick who can be prosecuted in this situation. But if it does, then it's not an arbitrary discrimination. There's a good reason for it. Sickness is, of course, a misfortune, not a vice, and you shouldn't discriminate against people on account of it unless there's a good reason, but that doesn't mean it's improper for the law, if it can, to stop them making their misfortune other people's misfortunes as well. All legal systems have certain criminal offences of specifically spreading certain diseases. Um, we certainly used to have a criminal offence of returning library books when you were suffering from um, smallpox, I think it was. I mean, was that an unfair discrimination against the sick? I don't think so. I think that's a muddled argument. It demonizes certain illnesses. The argument here is that by labeling them grievous bodily harm, then it makes the public unduly scared of them. And if public are unduly scared of them, that's bad for the sufferers. Remember how lepers used to be treated many centuries ago in Europe and more recently in Asia, um, excluded from society, going around with bells on their hats and so forth. And it also makes it harder to control the disease if there's an undue panic about it. One of the problems with Ebola virus in As Africa is people fleeing from it and people not seeking treatment because there's so much scare about it. <laughs> and the, some of the AIDS non-governmental organizations and some of the herpes non-governmental organizations are trying to say we must make sure the public don't think they're as bad as all that and so we shouldn't criminalize transmission because that makes it seem as if they're worse than they really are. But let's be realistic. What about genital herpes, for example? How much money would any of you take as the price of being given genital herpes? I expect most of you would say nothing, actually. No sum would be large enough to make me wish to be lumbered with that for the rest of my days. Um, of course, we have the problem of irresponsible press coverage. But then, as somebody commenting on um, Ma Matthew Weird's book said, sex inevitably sells tabloid newspapers, and death always sells tabloid newspapers, and sex plus death is an unbeatable combination. <laughs> um, the law should be made on the basis of scientific facts, not on the basis of foolish reaction by the media, let alone in order to try to prevent foolish reactions by the media. Next argument. It's unduly burdensome to the sick. That one goes back to Matthew Hale we saw earlier. There are at least three versions of this that I've heard. Oh, it's so embarrassing to have to admit that you've got genital herpes, or it's so embarrassing 
have to admit that you're HIV positive to your sexual partner? Well, my answer is, your blush is my potentially fatal illness. We have to have some balance between one disadvantage and another. Another argument is, well, look, if we allow criminal liability for reckless transmission of diseases, where is it going to stop? I mean, people passing on flu or colds, for example, does that mean they could then be prosecuted under the Defences Against the Person Act if they gave somebody flu and they were very ill with it when they travelled on the plane when they got flu or whatever? And the third form of it is, look how restrictive the Dika and Konzani decisions are for people who are HIV positive. They won't be able to play contact games, will they, for fear of infecting people? But it seems to me the answer to that argument is we're talking about reckless transmission, and recklessness has an objective element, doing something that is unreasonable in the light of the risk that you know exists. And certain risks have to be taken in order for people to live normal lives. I've supervised small groups of Cambridge students for many, many years, and often they've come to my supervisions with colds, and they've coughed and spluttered. But I've put up with that, as I think everybody else does. Catching colds is just something you have to put up with. You can't shut yourself away when you've got one. You can't shut other people away when they have them. But if somebody came into my supervision with bubonic plague <laughs> or Ebola virus, I would think it was unreasonable. And I think recklessness, which is an ingredient in the offence, is a flexible enough ingredient to see that it's not unduly burdensome. The so-called victim is the one to blame. Some people have said they're to blame because they should have asked whether the person they were going to bed with was HIV positive or had genital herpes or whatever. And um, we shouldn't convict criminally the person who infected them when it's their fault. Either we think it's partly their fault or we think it's all their fault. I have to say, I find this a surprising argument. C contributory negligence is not generally a defense to criminal liability. In burglary, it's no defense for the burglar to say, you were stupid to leave your window open. So that should let me off. In manslaughter, it's no defense to say the person whose death you killed through gross negligence was doing something they shouldn't have been doing we had a terrible case in England involving a Dutch lorry driver called Terry Wacker. And Terry Wacker was trying to import um, a number of dozens of illegal immigrants from somewhere in China. And he accidentally suffocated all but a few of them by shutting the ventilation shaft so nobody heard them when they were on the Dover to Calais ferry. And he tried to run this contributory negligent, they were all doing something wicked argument. And of course, the courts wouldn't listen nor they should. Um, and anyway, is somebody to blame when they trust another person in a sexual relationship? Maybe somebody is to blame if it's a casual sexual relationship, if it's commercial sex, maybe then um, you might expect them to take precautions or them to ask. But again, don't forget that we're talking about reckless infection and it means unreasonable behavior. And I would have thought not to disclose your HIV status or not to disclose your fact that you have genital herpes to a trusted sexual partner is an unreasonable thing to do. And it's not fair to say that the victim's to blame, even if you thought that um, contributory negligence should be a defense to criminal liability. Then there's the argument on public health grounds, we shouldn't allow the criminalization of the reckless transmission of disease because partners who know they've got it won't insist on taking precautions. And if partners don't insist on taking precautions, then the disease is more likely to be spread. We should encourage the sexual partners of everybody to take precautions themselves or to ask questions themselves. But... Um, <laughs> 
do you think it would really um, stop partners who had any sense uh, taking precautions or asking questions if they knew that defendants were criminally liable if they transmitted the disease? I mean, I, I know that burglars can be prosecuted if they're ever caught, but I don't go out at night and say to my wife, it's all right, dear, don't bother to lock the door. If anybody burgles this house, they're criminally liable. I mean, you have to have an intense faith in the efficacy of the criminal <coughs> law to stop taking precautions against crime because you think that people who commit crimes are going to be caught. I think it's um, an unrealistic argument to think that it would stop partners who realized there was a problem taking precautions if they thought if they knew that people who passed on the disease could be criminally liable. And then there's another public health argument. Carriers will avoid testing or treatment if they know that they can be convicted for reckless infection. HIV carriers won't get themselves tested or treated because they'll think it's better not to know they'll know that they can't be convicted of reckless transmission unless they knew. So they'll take jolly good care, in, take jolly good care not to know so they won't get themselves tested and so they'll transmit the diseases worse and more widely than otherwise they might. But I don't think that argument stands up either legally or practically. Recklessness includes not only actually knowing about the risk, but being willfully blind to the risk. If you suspect something so and shut your eyes to it, you can be reckless if it's unreasonable to take a risk of it. And somebody who suspects that they've got some serious transmissible disease and deliberately avoids getting tested in order not to find out could be prosecuted for reckless infection by passing it on. And that's recognized by the Crown Prosecution Service in their official guideline on prosecutions for intentional or reckless transmission of disease. They say, a deliberate closing of the mind by not undergoing testing may be a factor that a jury can take into account when deciding the question of the defendant's knowledge. Then practically, carriers need testing if they're going to get treatment. And if they're not treated, they're going to get worse or possibly die. It may have been the case at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, when there wasn't much you could do about AIDS, that people would rather know they didn't have it. Because you couldn't do much about it. But science, medical science, happily has developed. Retrovirals are available, which mean that HIV, being HIV positive doesn't mean a rapid death sentence anymore. And if people are sensible enough to take any notice of anything, then they'll know they need to get treatment if they think they might be <coughs> HIV positive, or else they're going to be dying of it fairly quickly. Um, a writer whom I'll mention more of in a moment, Udo Schuklenk, a professor of philosophy in Ontario in Canada, said he thought that this argument on public health grounds about people won't come forward to be tested was counterintuitive and we need empirical evidence really that people are actually put off from seeking testing because of it before we accept the counterintuitive suggestion that they would be. And then the last argument, what we need is education, not punishment. Well, I'd be the last to think that the criminal law, it can ever be very effective in solving social problems, and I'd be the first to say, or say would as a university professor, that education is a much better thing than is punishment. But at the same time, you can have both. And the fact that you have one doesn't necessarily preclude the other. And I would have thought we need both education and punishment when it's appropriate. Um, I think also... Um, we need to bear in mind two important limitations on criminal liability for reckless infection. As I've just said, recklessness has an objective element. It must be unreasonable what you did, as well as you're simply being aware of the risk. And secondly, informed consent. 
is a defense. If the person with whom you have sexual relations or the person with whom you're having dealings outside the sexual context who might be infected knows about the risk of infection and is prepared to take it, then Dika and Konzani and Golding and all the other cases say the defendant isn't liable. You can consent to the risk of infection. You can't consent to being deliberately infected, but you can consent to the risk of harm as against the deliberate infliction, infliction of harm. Let's move quickly to the other end of the spectrum. About, I'll skip over Crown Prosecution Service guidelines, which say prosecutors should take great care in deciding what to prosecute because time is running on and talk about, briefly, the other end of the spectrum, express criminalization of transmission of certain, knowing transmission of certain diseases or exposure of risk to the transmission of certain diseases. Well, some countries do indeed or have indeed passed legislation providing expressly for the criminalization of um, knowing transmission of certain diseases. Italy did for many years with Article 50, 554 of the Codice Penale, which is um, now been repealed. And that's what it used to say. In order to save time, I'll let you just look at the OHP on the screen rather than laboriously reading out what it says. Uh, criminal liability if you knew that you had syphilis and you passed it on to an unsuspecting person. Criminal liability if you knew you had gonorrhea and concealed the condition, and as a result, the other person became seriously ill. And some states in the United States and some countries in Africa have enacted similar legislation, though I note that in Western Europe, at least, we've tended to go back on it. Certainly, this was under the criminal code enacted by Mussolini and as part of the de mussolinization of Italian criminal law, I believe they repealed their offense of express criminalization. And my opinion on express criminalization is that there's no case for it. It's enough that it falls within the normal rules of criminal law, and we don't need to spread criminal liability any wider than the normal rules of criminal law. And if you start enacting special laws, to criminalize the transmission of certain diseases, then you do risk the demonization of people who carry it, which was one of the things, one of the arguments against allowing even normal criminal liability to apply. Is there any inherent problem with just applying the normal criminal law to um, the reckless transmission of diseases? Um, well, with our law at the moment, which, is, which limits criminal liability to actually transmitting the disease, there is a potential problem of causation, which some critics of the present law have said means we shouldn't criminalize it at all. But it seems to me, and it seems to others, the answer is only prosecute for these offenses when it's very clear that the defendant you're prosecuting actually did transmit the disease. There is another problem with using our criminal law, which is that the defendant's behavior is just as blameworthy, surely, even where the victim is lucky and doesn't catch the disease. Isn't it rather arbitrary to use English criminal law or Section 19 of the Hong Kong Ordinance, given that it only catches people who actually transmit it? And aren't the defendants who expose others to the risk of it just as bad, even where the disease isn't transmitted. And that raises the general issue, should there be general criminal liability for needlessly exposing other persons to serious danger? Some people would say yes. Some people would say no. And some legal systems have enacted specific offenses of knowingly exposing people to risks, and some people have managed to bring the reckless near transmission of disease within them. Very quickly, um, English criminal law has various specific offenses of risk creation in health and safety legislation, 
the details of which will be known to English lawyers and probably to many other lawyers as well, running your business in a way that likely to create risk to the health or physical safety of people coming into contact with it. France got as far as enacting a general offence of, of uh, exposing people needlessly to danger. That is Article 2231 of the Nouveau Code Penal in France, in translation. And when I looked into this, when I was preparing this lecture, I found, a little to my surprise, that in Germany and the Netherlands, they've actually managed to bring conscious risk-takers, including conscious risk-takers who consciously risk transmission of HIV within the criminal law by allowing them to be prosecuted for attempting to cause harm. To cut a, a long story short, in Dutch criminal law, you can be liable for an attempt, not only if you intended to do something, but also if you did it, realizing there was an unmerkelecker chance that you would cause it, a significant chance that you might cause it. That wouldn't work in English law, it wouldn't work in Hong Kong law, where basically, to be guilty of an attempt, you must actually intend the consequence. And, and in Canadian law, I found, that they've actually managed to interpret the law so as to say that not knowing of the risk of HIV infection has the effect of negativing the consent of the person having sexual intercourse with the result that you can be prosecuted for a sexual assault if you have intercourse with somebody who doesn't know about it. A line of argument which has been tried in England and rejected by our Court of Appeal and I imagine would be rejected by the courts in Hong Kong as well. My view is that reckless exposure to the risk of infection should be dealt with within the rules of criminal liability for exposure to risk. If you had a general offence of exposing people to risk, then it should be within it. If you didn't have a general offence of recklessly exposing people to risks, then it should fall outside it. And we shouldn't have a specific offence of exposing people recklessly to this type of uh, this particular type of risk. It's time for some rapid conclusions. Dr. Professor Udo Schuklenk is a philosopher of German origin who's a professor in Ontario who has written quite extensively on the ethics of criminalizing the transmission of disease and who has written a courteous but penetrating critique of Matthew Weert's book. And what he said is this. It seems to me that it's the opponents of criminalization who have to prove their case. He thinks it's proper to deal with it within the ordinary framework of the criminal law, which is what I've said. If an argument is made that in a specific context, e.g. where sex is involved, the deterrent effect does not work, empirical evidence must be produced and he said nobody's actually produced any then now I love doing this with an OHP presentation just watch when it goes round like that isn't that fun <laughs> the reason for this is that the criminal laws deterrent effect has been demonstrated time and again hmm well I broadly agree with Shuklink's conclusion I'm not sure that I agree with him about the criminal law's deterrent effect being demonstrated time and again. I think politicians make a big mistake when they think they can cure any social problem by creating a new offence, fuss in the papers, we'll have a law against it. I read a book that started um, like this. You used to hear two things. Um, one is, it's a free country, isn't it? The other one is, there ought to be a law against it. You don't hear either today. It isn't a free country, and there always will be a law against it. And um, that's the problem of, of uh, politicians having too much belief in the efficacy of the criminal law. But even if Schuklenk overstates the efficacy of the criminal law, that doesn't mean that, therefore, the criminal law has no efficacy whatsoever. Undoubtedly, some degree of criminalization will have some degree of effect. And there is a need sometimes to label as clearly wrong a piece of behavior which is harmful and which a lot of people currently think right. Years ago, 
We used to drink and drive quite readily in England. I'm old enough to have done that myself in my younger days. Changing the culture against it, one element was introducing legislation against drinking and driving. We have a problem in the United Kingdom at the moment with FGM, female genital mutilation. Um, female circumcision, as it's sometimes called, as practiced by certain racial groups, particularly mainly from um, Som Somalia and similar areas in East Africa. And there's a drive against this in the UK, quite rightly. And some people say, oh dear, you have to respect people's cultures, but you can't respect people's cultures when what they permit is serious harm to be done to other people. One of Weird's arguments in this is, you know, you have to accept that people are culturally directed and you mustn't criminalize the sort of things that people think it's right to do. Well, it's the job of the criminal law sometimes to make it clear it isn't right to do something and, as politicians love to say, to send a signal. I have a great friend who is a Welsh judge who um, has a pithy way of saying things and he said to me once when he was a barrister, he's more discreet now, he's a judge, Sending signals, sending signals. The Home Office seemed to think that we're a bloody lighthouse. He said. <laughs> uh, well, I think, potentially having within the normal framework of the criminal law the <coughs> reckless transmission of disease is something which does send some degree of a symbol, a signal, and I think criminal liability for reckless infection and or conscious risk-taking as well, if you normally have that within your criminal, criminal sy uh, justice system, though it won't solve the problem of disease spreading on its own, is an element which it's necessary to have in doing so. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Thank you, Professor Spencer. That is by far the most interesting criminal law lecture I've ever heard. And I hazard to guess that had I heard such lectures in my <coughs> uh, student days, I might not be here. I'll be a criminal lawyer. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I now invite questions from the audience. We have um, about 10 minutes for this uh, Q&A. As I indicated earlier, uh, it would be helpful if you could keep your questions short and to the point. I will also ask you to limit your questions to a single point or issue or a single comment. Your questions should be relevant to uh, this evening's topic. When you speak, please help us by stating your name and your affiliation. The floor is open. Uh, Dr. Lord, I'm a gynecologist. Um, I'm sorry, this might be a little bit of a long one because it, it starts with, I used to work in a clap clinic in London in 1985, uh, just as herpes was getting quite exciting. And I never thought I'd be on the side of the Herpes Association, but I think I am on this. So for the lawyers, herpes has herpes type 1 and herpes type 2. And before everyone discovered oral sex, herpes type 1 was cold sores, and herpes type 2 was genital herpes. Now it's pretty much 50-50. So on the first floor of the clap clinic was the male floor. And the men used to come in with herpes, and we used to go, if you're going to have sex with anyone, you better tell them you've got herpes. And they all went, don't be silly. We never do anything like that. And then on the female floor were lots of women who were celibate, miserable, and unable to have children because they confessed in the first date that they had herpes. So eventually, we worked out a way for the women to get round this. And the way the women got round it was to say, um, I'd love to do oral sex, but unfortunately, I have a cold sore. And it was brilliant because Three weeks later, when I did their follow-up, they, of course, had got a boyfriend, and the boyfriend wasn't at all bothered about the cold sore, despite the fact that the residual disease would be exactly the same as if the woman had confessed to her genital herpes. So I am on the side of the Herpes Association. 
and what do you think about my advice? <laughs> We're talking about reckless transmission of infection. We're not talking about simply knowingly exposing somebody to the risk. If you can minimize the risk in some sensible way, then it seems to me you're not recklessly transmitting the disease. I have no problem with somebody being prosecuted for passing on HIV, which of course is much, much more serious than herpes. I don't have any problem with somebody who suffers from genital herpes taking precautions against it, at any rate, in the initial stages of a sexual relationship. But I don't have any sympathy with a defendant like Mr. Golding, who was prosecuted in that case. Um, I think there has to be sensitivity in which cases are prosecuted. And fortunately, we have a discretion to prosecute. And uh, um, though I'm not in favor of lots and lots of people being sent to prison for transmitting genital herpes, it seems to me there is a case for people who knowingly and callously expose other people to the risk when it's possible to avoid exposing them to the risk. So I don't agree. I may have agreed with your advice, but I don't agree with your opposition to the existence of criminal liability. Hello, my name's Sarah. I'm here on exchange from the University of New South Wales in Australia, and I worked with UNDP on the Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Um, throughout your talk, you relied on people being sensible in their sexual encounters and sensible in their anticipation of criminal liability. My experience suggests that people aren't often um, sensible in this regard, particularly, for example, when people fear criminal prosecution, people are less likely to, in the event of a condom breaking or similar, inform their sexual partner that they ought to take uh, the post-exposure prophylaxis or similar. Do you not think that's a problem? I'm not sure that I understand the question entirely. You say that um, what exactly people are more likely to do or not likely to do? I think people are more likely, in the event of a condom breaking, thank you, um, that they wouldn't inform their partner, such that with the passage of time, their partner could have sex with other people, and therefore it couldn't be tied to them. Significant evidence from studies in Africa suggests that people do that. Again, we're talking about reckless transmission of disease. That means transmission of disease by unreasonable behavior. I suspect that the courts would say if somebody was using a condom, and particularly if they had a low viral count, they weren't reckless in exposing the other person to it, the risk, even if the other person didn't know. And um, for that reason, I am not worried about the prosecution of people in that position, certainly not worried enough to think that the law should be different from the way it's evolved in the cases that I mentioned. I'm Dr. King Ho, the consultant in charge of the, the local public STD service. And uh, well, I'd like to uh, let, uh, pose a little bit of comment and uh, for, the, um, for, the, uh, for the audience to think about the law is uh, for many of you who, uh, who, doesn't know, who, who doesn't know about the epidemiology of STD, sexual transmitted diseases or infections, I give you a little bit of information. For the, there is good evidence to show that about 10% of the local populations, in fact, it's 20% in the state, have evidence of infection, past infection of HSV2 infection, HSV2, not mentioned about HSV1. HSV2 is, is a herpes virus uh, which is thought to be uh, causing uh, genital herpes. About 10% of the local populations is in is carrier of hepatitis B. Though the local epidemiology, most of the cases, local cases are vertical transmission, not sexually transmitted, or not acquired through sexually transmitted. And it is good, there is good evidence to say that about 70, 70% of all sexually active adults in the world who have evidence past history of uh, contracting HPV, which is the virus that causes genital warts, and uh, well, a certain subtype of the, the HPV uh, related to esophageal cancer. And STI are very, very, very common, <laughs> and very, very common. And they are very heterogeneous, such as there are, well, the WHO says the four 
they not spots for uh, treated curable uh, sex STI, the gonorrhea, the syphilis, the uh, chlamydia, and, and trichomonas. And these are curable, treatable, curable. But s the other viral STI, the herpes, the, the HPV, HIV, they are treatable but not curable. Even the doctor cannot say for sure that's for HPV infection, that you are clear, boom. And to say to the patient that you have sex with your wife or your sex partner, with free of risk of uh, contracting, passing the virus to the, to the partner. And this is the practical problem, that there's so many people that are affected, infect, uh, infected with STI, and some of the uh, viral STI, they are not curable, are not curable. And uh, therefore, to define the term recklessness could be difficult to my patient. Thank you. Yeah, do you have any comments? I don't think I have a, a response to that comment. I'm interested in what you say. I simply hope that the courts would adopt a sensible interpretation of recklessness, and I hope public prosecutors would adopt a sensible policy in prosecuting only the most dreadful, callous people, as I think has been the case in England and Wales. When I think we've only had about 20 prosecutions for <coughs> passing on it, reckless, recklessly passing on STDs at all. So I'll thank you for the information, which I'm grateful to say, grateful to have, and hope the courts would interpret it sensibly when they had to deal with it. Um, hello. Um, I'm a student of this university, and my name is Mashad. I wanted to ask, like, when you were giving us the instances of three different cases, and you said that herpes was treated on the same level as spreading HIV virus, I wanted to know that because there are different kinds of diseases, like some contagious, like tuberculosis or uh, other levels of diseases, so in what level do you draw the distinction between which are criminally persecutable and which are not? Because it is kind of vague in terms of when you were explaining, because most of them include direct contact or sexually transmitted diseases. So how does it extend to contagious diseases in this case? The Court of Appeal in Golding, the most recent case, rather ducked the question by saying it's a matter for the tribunal of fact, meaning the jury to decide if what had been passed on was a really serious health problem. Um, and they didn't analyze it. I think if I had had to analyze it, I would have said being incurable is a large part of it. If it's something that sh can be cured, um, that's, it's got to be much nastier than something that can't be cured. And I think they were influenced in upholding the conviction by the information that they were dealing with a condition which somebody was going to be stuck with for the rest of their lives, even if it wasn't actually going to threaten their life. Yes, hi. Um, my name is George. I'm with the Center of Humanities and Medicine here at Hong Kong University. Um, first, allow me to thank you for a clear and well drawn out uh, presentation. Uh, I have some issues, though. Um, one of them is being that I find a lot of the times when we're speaking of criminalization, there isn't enough, there isn't enough um, elaboration on, on recklessness and what's causing recklessness. And that is generally ignored in law for good reasons, although in this instance, when we're speaking of disease, I find kind of brushing off the demonization of certain illnesses is not necessarily conducive because if if you factor in um, much of the recklessness that comes about is due to the fact that people cannot bring themselves to admit certain of these diseases to their partners, this is generally what causes recklessness. Mm -hmm. And I think it is very much um, a direct correlation with demonization of the illness and prosecution. So prior to s putting in certain effects of prosecution, I think it would be better to maybe explore the venue a bit more through the humanities, through ethics, through many fields, rather than just have a pure, pure conversation of law. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm interested in, interested in what you say, and I'm acutely aware that there are two sides to this question, and that many people have argued that the transmission of disease, even if reckless, should be taken outside the criminal law. But I would just invite those who so think to read the Court of Appeal judgment in Dika and the Court of Appeal judgment in Konzani and see what those people did, and ask yourself if you really think 
that that conduct should fall outside the criminal law. I find, on reading those cases, that I think that they ought to, and I think the law would be deficient if it didn't permit at least defendants as callous as those to be prosecuted. I just hope it wouldn't be carried out in such a way that a lot of other people in less serious cases were also prosecuted. Um, hi, uh, my, my name is Dr. Chris Hoy. I'm respiratory and critical care medicine. Um, in in terms of the uh, context of the in in context of, of of previous questions, actually, perhaps I might invite Professor Spencer to comment a little bit about how prevalence of any given disease, background prevalence, impacts our consideration from the legal perspective. Uh, about the definitions of reckless behavior and, and how that might impact how the law looks at individual conduct within the sort of broader perspective. So total volume of cases in which anybody's been prosecuted are rather small, and the number of cases in the common law world where the legislation is the same as ours, where the appeal courts have discussed recklessness is even smaller, so the field is somewhat open. Um, but I think when we're talking about whether it's reckless to run the risk of it, we're talking about the gravity of the effects of the on the health of the person concerned rather than the prevalence of the disease. And it may be that if it's something which ever so many people have and ever so many people have to go about their daily lives to stay alive, it ceases to be reckless when there's nothing much else you can do other than do things that involve contact with other people. So I think in that sense, the fact it's very prevalent may mean it's not reckless to run certain risks of transmitting it to others. I think recklessness involves not only the seriousness of the disease, but the ease with which you can take precautions against spreading it. And I suppose if it's very prevalent, then it's going to be harder to take uh, precautions against spreading it. So it is indirectly related. But thank you for your thought-provoking question. Thank you, Professor Spencer. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that's all we um, have time uh, for this evening. May I once again thank you for taking the time and the trouble to, uh, to attend this lecture despite the very difficult weather. May I also ask you to join with me in thanking Professor John Spencer for, for delivering the Wing Hatton Lecture tonight. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and good night.